Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for bearing with me for a few minutes. I'd like to speak a little bit tonight about Shabbos Batamos and about the three weeks, maybe also what, what led to it, and maybe uh, to get a new understanding. I had this, this idea that I had today. I think there's a, I hope it's a, uh, an idea that you'll enjoy, something that, that I thought about today. It says as follows. My notes. Sorry. This is very fresh, so I have notes. I, I often don't do notes, but today we're going to be doing notes anyway. Okay. We know the, the Mishnah says in Tanis, there are five things that happened to our forefathers on Shivas Matamas and the five things that happened on Tishimov. And then the Mishnah elaborates and lists the five things. The Shivas Matamas, Shivas Matamas, the Shtabra Haluchas, the Luchas were broken, and Uvatal Atomid, the carbon Tomid was abolished, meaning they weren't able to bring it anymore. The Hufkar here, and the city was breached, the walls of the breached. Vesaraf Apostomos Arasha Satara Apostomos was a, an evil king. He burned the Sefer Torah. Either Behemid or Behuamot Salem Hechel. Either he himself put a Salem, he put a graven image in the Hechel, or maybe some say it wasn't him who put it in, but rather it was somebody else who had put it in. But either way, either which way, these are the five things that happened in on Shivas Vatamas. And I wanted to discuss the following idea, the following thought that I had. You look at these five tzaras. Is there any connection between the five tzaras? And if there is a connection between these five tzaras, what is that connection and what can we learn from that connection? So I'd like to look at the first one of these tzaras to understand what is going on. So let's think about this. The first one of the tragedies is Nishtabru HaLuchas. The Luchas were broken. And if you think about the whole Nishtabru HaLuchas, I'm going to let, let's look at it. Let me, let's discuss the entire thing. Take, for example, let's say you had a couple that's having marital issues. And this couple has been fighting and things have been thrown around from one side to the other of the room and they're screaming at it. It's just awful. I remember when we came here to Manchester, the first time when we had Moishi about 14 years ago, we rented a flat in Devonshire Court. And above us, directly above us, lived a couple. My wife once met this wife in the hallway and she said, you know, we like to have a good row once in a while. Now, she said that we like to have a good row once in a while. The truth is, it was probably twice a week and my wife sometimes literally wanted to call 999. The screaming that was going on up there was just unbelievable. If you dare, you know, there was the screaming and back and forth. My wife said sometimes she would just take my, she put him in a buggy and, and walk out the flat. She just, she couldn't bear the fighting. It was so awful. It was so terrible. And she said, literally, you'd hear things shattering and breaking. It was, it was terrible. And you hear all that. And then you hear one day, they got to get, you yeah. so sad. So, so sad. Say, a lot of people would say, well, that's, that's not so sad, is it? You know, this is, this is coming. This has been many, many years in the making, so to speak. It's not really that sad. That's number one. Number two, if you think about it, which bit of the whole thing is sad? The get? The get's not sad. The get is the final blow to this entire marriage. It's, it, it's over. The sad bit is way before that. The sad bit in this marriage is the fighting and the throwing the stuff at each other and the fact that they're dinging along. All that is very, very sad, but I wouldn't say that the get is sad. The get's just the final step of everything. So now let's look at this again. So if you understand in this muscle, let's look back at what the... What the Mishnah says to us. The first tragedy is Nishtabru Haluchos. The Luchos were broken. Do you know what happened before the Luchos were broken? Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to Shemaim. He's there. He's there for a little bit too long, or so think the Jewish people. And so they come to Chor and they say, Chor, create some kind of leader for us. And Chor said, I'm not doing that. So it took Chor and they killed him. They came to Aaron and they said, Aaron, create a leader for us. So Aaron says, I need all the gold off your wives. They decided, forget it, we're never going to get anything off our wives. That we're not for sure, that's not going to happen. Instead, they went, they took their own gold, they give it to Aaron, Aaron throws it into the fire, and out comes this golden calf. That's already a tragedy. 
Then they say, Aaron is trying to procrastinate. So he says, Chag you know what we'll do? We won't make today the Yom Tov. Tomorrow will be the Yom Tov. The next day they wake up, they wake up early, they start doing Avodah Zarah and Gilu Arayas and Shrikas Dom and Ayyukum It says, there's all sorts of terrible things going on. And Moshe Rabbeinu is told, Lech go down, Ki Shichei Samcha Shalei Your nation that you took out Mitzrayim, do you know what happened to them? Do you know how low they've fallen, what's happened to these people, and Moshe Rabbeinu dams for them, and he saves them, and he comes down, and he sees the egg, and he goes, I can't believe it, and he throws the luchas on the floor, and everyone goes, oh, what a shame for those luchas. The luchas. Who cares about the luchas? A shame, a shame for the fact that they killed Khor. A shame for the fact that they gave all the gold. A shame for the fact that they created a golden calf. A shame for the fact that they served the golden calf, that they did idolatry, that they did Shri Chazdamin, that they did immoral acts. That they shechted Korbanus rays. That's where the shame is. That's what we should embarrass about. So the Mishra says, Chamisha, Dvarim, Eros, Avesenu, Shivas, Ratamus. Five things on the Shivas, Ratamus. You know what happened on Shivas, Ratamus? Yeah. The golden calf was erected and they served the golden calf. No. That's child's play. They broke the Luchos. Who cares about the Luchos? Okay, I mean, not who cares about the Luchos. Obviously, Luchos are important, but, you know, the Luchos seem to be almost a side point in this entire story. That's not the tragedy. The tragedy is not the Luchos. The tragedy is everything that comes before the Luchos. The Luchos is just the get at the end. So what are we so upset about? And why do we call it that? We, why don't we say that they, the problem was, or the tragedy was, that they served a golden calf? And the... The strangest thing of the whole thing is if you look at the final Rashi in the Torah. So can I just get a Chomsh? Can I trouble someone to get me a Chomsh? The final passage in the Torah speaks about Moshe Rabbeinu, that there was nobody that come out, nobody came Moshe, Asher Hashem upon him, upon him. No, there was no Nabi that ever was that ever came again like Moshe Rabbeinu, whom HaKadosh Baruch spoke to face to face. And who created these tremendous miracles? And the Torah finishes off the final, final sentence. The penultimate sentence: "Lechala osus v'amos and all the signs and all the wonders that God Hashem who sent them to do in Eretz Yisrael to Paro and to all the servants and to his entire land. Ulechala yada chazak all the strong hand. Ulechala mora gadol and all the awesome power. Asher also Moshe, which Moshe did leinei kol Yisrael. So says Rashi: Lechala yada chazak or shekiba lasatara beluchas meyado." The Yadah has a strong hand. You know what the strong hand of Moshe Rabbeinu was? He was able to accept the luchas from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's a strong hand. That's amazing. Ulechol HaMor HaGadah, the great awesome things that he did. Nisim and Burs, which were in the Midbar HaGadah of Anora. Asher also Moshe, which Moshe did. Le'enei Kol Yisrael. Before the eyes of all Kol Yisrael. Says Rashi. Shinasoi Libar Lishbar HaLuchas Le'enei. You know what Moshe Rabbeinu did? And there's a strange language being used over here. Shinasa libo. His heart raised him up to break the luchas. He was raised up by, 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 by you know, what, what does that mean? His heart was raised to break the luchas. You'd say he was enraged. You wouldn't say that he had, uh, you know, he, there's, you, know so you, never, you never see people say, like, you know, I had a real moment of pathos this year. You know, today I had a real moment of inspiration. Really, what happened? I gave my wife a divorce. You know, like you know, that's that, that's a moment of inspiration. I, you know, the moment of inspiration was I broke the luchos. Well, what's so inspiring about breaking the luchos? That shina so libo, and then it continues. The schema das hakodesh baruch the data shenema asher shibato yasher koy asher shibato, and that's how Rashi finishes the whole perish on the Torah. That hakodesh baruch agrees with Moshe Rabbeinu. Hakodesh baruch says, "You know what? You broke the luchos." Wonderful, Yasha Kayach. Wonderful, wonderful that you broke the luchos. End of the Torah. So, if Hakadosh Baruch Hu thinks it's so great that we broke the luchos, why is that one of the tzaras that happened on uh, on Chamisha? Yeah. You know? So, look at this. I mean, the Mishnah just says, you know, that five tragedies that happened on Shabbos by Thomas. Tragedy number one, the luchas were broken. Guess what? That's not a tragedy. Hashem says that was wonderful. Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Yashakar Shibata. That was a good idea. Well done. Well, then that's not a tragedy. You know, you never get somebody that pats you on the back and says, that was well done. That was awful. I know, but that was well done. 
could have signed. Is it awful? Is it a tzara? Is it a tragedy? Or is this something to be happy about? Or is this something where Gosh Bokul says, Yashakach? So how do we understand this? So I saw today, Rav Sham Shafal Hirsch writes an amazing thing. He explains in the Pasuk over there, when we speak about in, in Pasha's Kisisa, when it says, Amosha Rabbeinu came down and he broke the Luchos. So just give you the... Um, It will be Perek Lameh Beis Pasuk Yutes, if you want to look it up in Rav Hirsch's Chumash, in Rav Hirsch's Pshat. But Rav Hirsch says the following. He says, what happened over here? Moshe Rabbeinu is up in Shemaim. He's, been, he's receiving the Torah. Kodesh Baruch comes to Moshe Rabbeinu. Says, Kodesh, and Kodesh Baruch comes to Moshe Rabbeinu says, Moshe, the people you've taken out of Egypt have done terrible sins. So what would you expect Moshe Rabbeinu to do at that moment. You'd expect him to run down and to tell the Jews off. To, you know, no, no, no. Moshe Rabbeinu, the first thing he does is Vayichal Moshe Snash and Akolas, we just spoke about. It says to Moshe Rabbeinu, it says, Vayom Hashem and Moshe, Lech Reid go down. Ki Shich Hezam Vashalei Simit Tzayim. He came late, they made the God, and Hashem says to Moshe, go down because Ki Shich Hezam Vashalei Simit Tzayim, the nation which you have taken out of Mitzrayim has become corrupted. So I am in Adash, etc., 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 and they says, and I will get angry at them and I will destroy them. And I will make you into a great nation. Moshe Rabbeinu should have run down then and there. Should run down says, I'm going to, I'll take care of it. I'm going down to speak to the Jewish people. First things first, it says, Moshe Rabbeinu has a conversation with HaKadosh Baruch and says, Why are you getting upset? Remember, Avram, Yisrael, Abedecha, Shishbatam, you support them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, okay, fine. Not willing to take it back. Moshe Rabbeinu goes, phew, okay. First part of it. Vayiv ben Vayir Moshe ben Ahar Moshe ben comes down and he's got the two luchas in his hands. Baluchas ma'asel kim heim ha'michal kim. It's all godly. It's tremendous godliness. And he hears Yeshua hears a voice in the back. He says, "Kol mechama machne." And he says, "There must be some kind of war." And he says, "I don't know what that is." Kol anoch anochi shamei. I do hear a sound of distress. They get down. Vayikah shakar ma'machne. Get to the machne. Vayas ego mechos. And he sees only the eagle and he sees the dancing. Vayikah Moshe Moshe gets upset. Vayashlech miyonav asaluchas vayshavas am dagas har. And he throws the luchas down and he breaks them down at the foot of the at the mountain. What happened? He's been on the Jews' side. He's defended the Jews. He's, he's saved the Jews from destruction and annihilation. He comes down. He says to you, Yeshua says, I hear, I hear fighting. I hear battles. I don't know what to do. I don't know what this is. He says, no, no, I hear distress. This is distress. I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, I hear people, you know, when, when, I hear, when you hear people, when you talk about distress, you're talking about people not doing well. And then Moshe, if, I, if you heard somebody distress, you wouldn't come down and then lose your temper at somebody who's in distress. And yet Moshe Rabbeinu comes down by Yifen, and Moshe looks down at the Jewish people by Yashem, and somebody sees the Egel Mechos, by Yashlech Miyad of Zaluchas, he throws the Luchas down on the ground. What's he throwing the Luchas for now? What happened? Until now he was a Jew's protector, and suddenly he's changed his mind. He says, I'm protecting, I'm protecting you. What? And then everything comes flying down. He explains Rabbi Hirsch, he says, you know what happened over here? There was a change in what Moshe Rabbeinu saw. Moshe Rabbeinu felt, and this is an important thing, he said, as long as it's in the realm of thought, we can argue. Once it turns from the realm of thought to the realm of action, then we're in trouble. So Moshe Rabbeinu is told, I heard that they had a problem. They strayed. Okay, they strayed. Fine. They made an ego. Fine. Well, We'll have the discussion with them. Sit down. We'll have a philosophical discussion. We'll be able to convince them. We'll be able to tell them exactly why they're wrong, etc., etc. Says of her, she comes down by eyes, the ego nocholos. He suddenly sees that we have moved beyond a philosophical problem. We have moved from a philosophical problem to a problem of action or inaction, however you want to see it, but a problem where the Jewish people have now become entirely corrupted. They are full of this Yetzirah, the Mecholos. They're singing, they're dancing, they're shechting, they're doing all these Averas. It's now become part and parcel of them. Says Rav Hirsch, Moshe Rabbeinu looks at that and he says, this is it. We're finished. There is no way to give these people these luchos. It doesn't work anymore. 
Meluchas were given to the people of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to God's nation. God's nation is no longer God's nation. They would have been if it was just a question of thought. But because the action was so strong, because what they did was so terrible, Moshe Rabbeinu says, that's it, finished. I have to take these luchas, I have to break them. And he takes them and he breaks them because he says, Kalal Yisrael is not fit for purpose anymore. And if they're not fit for purpose, they don't deserve these luchas, and the luchas need to go on the ground. And I think that's the explanation, coming back to the questions, and we'll come back to the first question as well. So let's go back to our questions that we asked. What's the big deal of, of breaking the luchas? It was the ego, it was everything else that was so bad. If you understand what the breaking of the luchos means, the breaking of the luchos meant not only that they served the ego, because Moshe Rabbeinu knew that they served the ego, but breaking the luchos meant that they had not only served the ego, but they had gone beyond the point of no return. So bad that Moshe Rabbeinu had to break the luchos. That's how bad it was. Right? So if I were to go back to that example and I said to them, you know, you have a couple that row, but many couples row. And there are plenty of couples that could row for 50 or 60 or 70 years. They'll fight and they'll fight and they'll fight and they love it. I don't know if they love it, but you know, it's part of their life. You know, come home and there's no fight. He's like, there's nothing wrong today. You know, <laughs> it's boring. Come on, say something, you know, uh, provoke me something. But they fight and they fight and they fight, but they stick together. Because at the end of the day, there's something deep down that's still binding them together as a couple. So that's still important. Yes, the rows are a problem. Of course we shouldn't be rowing. Of course that's not what we want to do. But the bottom line is, even if we did row, okay. So you fight. But then, you know what a get says? A get says it's over. That's it. There's been one too many rows. There's been one too many fights. There's been one too many things thrown at each other. There's one too many comments. We are done. That's what's sad. Because sometimes you look at that get and you say, you know what? That might have been preventable. You ever seen a couple that got divorced and you said to yourself, it wasn't really that bad? Maybe that didn't need to go as far as it did. Maybe it didn't need to absolutely break down. Or if somebody had caught it that little bit earlier, it wouldn't have broken down. It wouldn't have turned into the tragedy that it turned into. Maybe you're right. By the time it turned into that tragedy, it was too late. That's it. It's a tragedy. Now it's finished. It's over. But it could have been stopped. And that's the sad part of a nishtabru haluchos. Because it means nishtabru haluchos is that get where you say to yourself, it might have been possible to fix. Maybe, maybe. But the get says, it's over. No more. We're not fixing this anymore. It's finished. That's very sad. So we look at the Nishtabru HaLuchas and we say, that's the sad thing about Nishtabru HaLuchas. Because everybody can get into fight and everybody can row and everybody can have trouble or tsaris. But Nishtabra HaLuchas says, it's finished. It's over. Finito. This entire relationship has broken down beyond repair. Not fit for purpose anymore. That is terribly sad. Says the Mishnah, five tsars happened to our forefathers on Shivasa Batamus. The first one is Nishtabru Haluchas. The first tsara is that Moshe Rabbeinu had to break the luchas. Moshe Rabbeinu had seen that the Jewish people had gone beyond the point of no return. That's it. We had to break the luchas. Not fit for purpose anymore. Over. Says Moshe Rabbeinu, it's sad, but I have to break the luchas. Says Hashem, you're absolutely right. As it stands now, it's over. Yashakoach Shashibarta. You're right, you're absolutely right. As it stood at that point in time, there was no way of ever fixing it ever again. You have to break the luchas and you have to start all over again. And you know, there are people, there are couples that get divorced and then sometimes, strangely enough, they go for therapy and they get married again. But sometimes they needed to get divorced to shake them out of all that. And they need to live a year by themselves, this one, a year by themselves, that one, a year by themselves, to see the loneliness and say, I always thought it was so much better without you. It's actually not better without you. It's better with you. And then to come back together again after extensive therapy. And that's what's happening over here. So then 
You look back and you say, yes, Nishtabra Haluchas. It was terribly sad at the time that Nishtabra Haluchas. But Yashakayach Shashibat, because if you hadn't broken the Luchas, if we hadn't gotten divorced, we wouldn't have lived a year without each other. And if we hadn't lived a year without the two of each other, each one without the other one, and then gone through therapy, we never would have been able to remarry and create this new bond that we have now. So Moshe Rabbeinu, it was sad, but it was happy. It has this dichotomy in it. The Yashakar Shishibata, you're right for breaking it on the one hand. But on the other hand, yes, it's a Torah that it needs to be broken. And I think that is really what you have to look at when you look at all the other Torahs in Shiva So let's look at it. Butal Karman Tamid. I mean, I started looking at the Karman Tamid of Hirsch has a long piece about the Karman Tamid as well, but I figured we weren't going to, I wasn't, I didn't want to go into everything sort of in detail. But Butal Karman Tamid, the Karman Tamid was a Kodesh Baruch Hu's Rotson of having a daily amount of avoda from the Jewish people. I wanted a certain amount of service every single day from the Jews. As carbon ni lach mi leishai, my carbon, my lechem leishai, my fire carbon every single day, one in the morning, one in the evening, no matter what, no matter when, there was always a carbon. And then that stops. You know what that shows when that stops? Again, it shows carbonus, we're finished. There's no need for them anymore. God says, it was, it was okay, it was limping, it was working, it wasn't working, it's not working anymore. Over. And that's Butel HaTomit. You don't bring the Tomit anymore. So it's not only that we don't bring a carbon. As HaKadosh Baruch was saying, this part of the relationship, not working anymore. Breaching of the cities of the wall, of Yerushalayim, the walls of the city. Again, there was always this almost powerful exterior that didn't let anybody else in and some of that who says you know what come on in it's finished it's over right the door has been broken anybody who wants to come in now can come in i remember once went to a chasna years ago there was a chasna was a fellow from vienna a very very wealthy fellow and he made this ridiculous chasna i mean if i say ridiculous he took this ups hole and he redid it he spent like three four million pounds on this chasna something absolutely ridiculous and they were, it was just absolutely crazy. And what he had done is they had sent out invitations to everybody. And then if you had an invitation to the dinner, there was an extra bit that you got in the invitation. And when you got to the dinner, you would present it to a bouncer. There were two big black bouncers, you know, as they make them in America, just these two huge guys standing there. And you had to show them your ticket and they would let you in one at a time, one at a time. And basically, the chuppah was massive. There were about 10,000 people at the chuppah. It was this huge monstrosity of a chuppah. And finally, they finished the chuppah. And now it comes to the dinner. And what you expected was that everybody just would leave. You had a ticket. You had an invitation. You go in. You don't have an invitation. You don't go in. And what happened basically was there was a whole bunch of people that decided we're going in anyway. So the bouncer standing there says, no, you can't go in. No, you can't go in. No, you can't go in. And they said, but I'd like to go in. No, you can't go in. And it's only five people and 10 people and 20 people. And they literally, they created a blockade. And they were running against this guy, 20 or 30 big Hasidim. Boom! Once, twice, three times. And this big guy standing there, he's like, you know, you know what? I'm not getting killed to keep these guys out from a wedding. That's ridiculous. You know? He moved out of the way, and you should have seen this stampede. Whoosh! Everybody went in, everybody took seats. They were announcing anybody who's not been invited, please leave. Nobody would leave. It was it was just one of the biggest Chilah Hashems I've ever been to. We were sitting, my father, my father, who is uh, not known to be bashful, decided there were like these these, these three main rows, like they're called paranches, where the Rebbe sits. My father said, we were invited. And he said, come. And he takes me, and we sat down on the branches. We sat down on the, you know, on, on the dates. We're sitting on the dates. And I'm like, Daddy, we can't sit here. This is the dais for the Rebbe's with the Shreimlech, and the, you know, I'm 16. I can't. He goes, we have a ticket. Here's where we sit. And I had this guy who passed by me, and I turned to this fellow, and I said to him, I bet you've never done a dinner as big as this before. And this fellow says, actually, I've done a state dinner for the queen with three and a half thousand people. Just there, everybody who was there was actually invited. <laughs> But once that door opened, there was no holding back. My, my mother and my sister were on the women's side, and they were standing all the way in the front of the line. And when the door opened, my sister lost a button of, of a, you know, she had like a decorative button. She lost a button on her dress. And my mother says, don't you dare 
you know, bend over to pick up that button. That's a stampede. You won't survive this. You just go. And that's what happened. The Gosh Baruch says, we had this, you know, you had this wall around Yerushalayim. It's keeping everybody out. And finally, boom, they made their way through it. The Gosh Baruch says, the door is open now. The bouncers moved out of the way. Go. Do what you want. Everybody, come in. Finished. The holiness of the city is gone. The same with Sarfa Satara. How can somebody burn the Torah? But that is it it symbolizes the holiness of that Torah and not being fit for that purpose. And the last thing, Homa Telam Hechel, you put a Tselem, you put an Avodazara in the base of Mikra Rebbe saying, do what you want. Put an Avodazara in the base of Mikra. See if I care. It's not much of a base of Mikra nowadays anyway. Go for it. See what I, you know, doesn't matter. That's what these Tsaras symbolize. They symbolize. Again and again, this idea that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has taken this relationship and said the relationship is more or less over in this specific instance, whether it is with the Luchos, where we explained it more in depth, or in all these other cases. And now you have the three weeks, and the three weeks is the time where you have to sit and you have to think to yourself, is my relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu fit for purpose? Is my Yiddish guide fit for purpose? Because we only have the breaching of the walls, the destruction of the Beis Amigdash, the entire destruction. God didn't destroy the Jews. He just destroyed that, that bond he had with them. The Luchas were broken, but the, the Jewish people still survived. You have the breaking of the wall, but you have three weeks between the breaking of the wall and the Beis Amigdash being destroyed. And you ask yourself in those three weeks, okay, the walls have been breached. But is it beyond any repair? Is it going to have to move on to stage two or to the final stage where we not only break through the walls, we actually break down the Beis Amigdash and the Beis Amigdash also gets destroyed? How far are we going to go? How far does it need to go before we wake up and we say to ourselves, and I'm sure the Jewish people, when they saw it, and by the way, you read in the passage, when the Jewish people saw the luchas broken, the entire party stopped. It's not like the Moshe of He broke the Lucas and people are like, ah, who cares? The Lucas are broken. We're having a great time with it. They turned around and said, here's Moshe. The Lucas are broken. What do we do? You read the next Moshe right away. Moshe Rabbeinu takes the eagle and he grinds up the eagle. Nobody said, don't you touch our golden calf. That's our God. Moshe Rabbeinu is here. He broke the Lucas. They say, take the eagle, do whatever you want to. Moshe Rabbeinu took them and was able to rejig and reform the entire Jewish people to make sure that nothing happened. This is our chance. These three weeks are the time where you sit and you think about that. And you say to yourself, where is my Yiddishkeit? Where is my, you know, Achtos? You want to speak about Achtos and Klaliso? Is our Achtos and Klaliso really fit for purpose? Or is it broken? Is there so many fragments? Are we so fragmented and everybody thinks to themselves, I'm okay. He, he is a frommer. Him, he doesn't know anything about Yiddishkeit. Yeah? And everybody thinks to themselves, wherever you are, whether you are traditional or whether you are modern Orthodox or whether you are Haredi or whether you're Yeshivish or whether you're Hasidish, everybody's always looking in, in all directions. And I'm not as crazy as them because they're crazy, but I'm not as, you know, fry as them either. Like, I'm grounded. I'm sort of the middle of the road. Everybody's telling themselves that they're the middle of the road. And everybody else is, they don't have it 100% right. And we always look at other people and you've got to think to yourself, this is really the time to think. Our achtos, is it really what it should be or is it not really fit for purpose? Our morals, our Torah. So if Apostomus is a Torah, Apostomus burned the Torah. So you look at the Torah and say, our learning, is our learning what it should be? Is our appreciation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and appreciation of what Torah should be, is that really something? Or is it lacking? Is it full of holes? Is it full of just... Air. There's a whole bunch of hot air. You take, a, you take a pin, you make a hole in the balloon, the whole thing goes pop, and that's it. It's gone. Your avoida. Hotel atomic, a gosh Your avoida, so it means your tvila or any other avoida you do for gosh bohu. Does it need to be re examined? Do you need to look at it again and say to yourself, maybe I'm not really doing a good job. Maybe I could be doing better than what I'm doing right now. I think we could take away the maybe. I could be doing better than what I'm doing now. I don't know how bad, how, you know, you decide for yourself. Are we 
Are we in destruction mode? Are we literally self-destructing? Or are we at least a little bit better than that? I mean, the state of the Jewish people nowadays, it's not wonderful in many, many regards. Even though we have more people learning than we've ever had learning before, more people dabbling than we've ever had before, and that there's a reawakening for Truman, but we're, we're not doing great. When we would say that the state of the Jewish people is like, you know, we've never had such a great Jewish people as, you know, there's never been a generation as great as our generation. So think about it. You have three weeks now, between now and Tisha B'Av, between the entire destruction and just the beginning of the destruction, to think and to say to yourself, is this where I want to be? Is this what my Yiddishkeit is all about? Are there holes all around? Am I just broken luchas, and am I just heading straight for a broken Mesa Migdash? Or is there more to it? Can I do better? Can I do more? And if the answer is yes, you have three weeks now to work on building that. That's what you have the three weeks for. It's your time to try and build and rebuild. And Mir Hashem, if we focus on that, if we try to build and we try to rebuild in Mir Hashem, then together we won't have to go through Tisha B'Av. Again, we have Mir Hashem this year, Tisha B'Av, Yafach, Lon, and Sos, and Simcha will be eating on Tisha B'Av anyway because it's going to be Shabbos. But hopefully Yud Ba'av won't exist either. By Yud Ba'av will be in Yushalayim. It'll be wonderful. We're able to say, we took the lesson of Nishtam Ruhaluchas and we said the relationship was broken, but we can fix it. We don't have to go for entire destruction. Thank you very much.